Welcome everyone to our webinar, Just Transition from a Militarized Fossil Fuel Economy to a Green Economy. I'm Chris Oppie, Professor of History at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Director of the Ellsberg Initiative for Peace and Democracy. Tonight's event is part of a year long series called the Existential Threat Project with a focus on the threats posed by climate change and nuclear weapons and what we can do to reduce those threats uh, and ultimately eliminate them. I'd like to announce two upcoming events. This Thursday, October 10th, also at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we're having uh, an online webinar on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, featuring an extraordinary panel of activists and activist scholars who will talk not only about the existential crisis posed by the still strong possibility of nuclear war, but about uh, the damage nuclear weapon, weapons testing and production have already done. Later in the fall, on December 2nd, we will host the third annual Ellsberg Lecture, featuring the well-known climate justice writer and activist Bill McKibben. For more information about these and other upcoming events, please go to our website, eipad.org, eipad.org. Our work is inspired by the life and legacy of Daniel Ellsberg. Ellsberg is primarily known for his opposition to the Vietnam War and his extraordinary act of moral courage when he turned over to the press and public a 7,000 page classified history of the Vietnam War that came to be known as the Pentagon Papers, which uh, those documents exposed more than two decades of lies by US leaders of both parties about the causes and conduct of that war what is not nearly as well known about Ellsberg is that he devoted much of the next 50 years of his life to activism devoted to the elimination of nuclear weapons and in more recent decades to the pursuit of environmental justice. Ellsberg died last year, but I know he would have found tonight's webinar extremely important. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion of how we might transition away from an economy based so significantly on fossil fuels and massive military spending to one that lives up to the promise of a carbon neutral green economy. And to do so in a way that is just to people whose jobs and lives have been dependent on fossil fuels and work related to the military and weapons production. As you listen, uh, please post any questions uh, you may have into the Q&A and in the uh, final half hour or so, we'll try to address some of them. So let me now introduce tonight's panelists. Robert Pollan will serve as both moderator and participant. Bob is Distinguished University Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts, where he is also the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute. He's also the founder and president of Pollan Energy and Retrofits, PEAR, a green energy company operating throughout the United States. He's written many books, so I'll just mention a few that are relevant to our discussion tonight. Green Growth in 2014, Greening the Global Economy the year, the year after that, and Climate Crisis and the Golden, I'm sorry, cri Climate Crisis and the Global <laughs> Green New Deal, which was uh, co-authored with uh, Noam Chomsky in 2020. He has worked as a consultant for the US Department of Energy, the International Labor Organization, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and numerous non-governmental organizations in the US and around the world. We're also hoping to have Norman Rogers join us, though he's now testifying before a commission and so remains uncertain when he'll uh, arrive. But he is the uh, second vice president of United Steelworkers Local 675, an amalgamated union that represents workers in a variety of industries, including oil, chemicals, paper, and car wash. He uh, has also worked for more than 25 years at the Marathon Oil Refri Refinery in Los Angeles County. As a union leader, Norman has been very active in health and safety issues, contract negotiations, and for more than a decade, he has worked with environmental groups to improve safety regulations at refineries and chemical plants. He is now deeply engaged in the struggle to ensure a just transition to a green economy for fossil fuel workers. Miriam Pemberton is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC, where she directs its Peace Economy Transitions Project. 
She was also the first director of the National Commission for Economic Conversion and Disarmament. She's been working for decades on the connections between climate change and militarism. Hmm. With Lawrence Korb, she headed the team that produced the annual Unified Security Budget for the United States. With William Hartung, she edited Lessons from Iraq, Avoiding the Next War. She is also the author of Six Stops on the National Security Tour, Rethinking Warfare Economics. She holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. So with that, I'm happy to turn the proceedings over to Robert Pollan. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thank you uh, to Chris and everyone at the Ellsberg Initiative for organizing this event. And I'll just say myself, I am really, really pleased and honored to be sharing this occasion with two people about whom I have tremendous respect and have learned a huge amount from uh, Miriam Pemberton and Norman Rogers, assuming Norman shows up. <laughs> I know he's involved in a, uh, a hearing in, in California right now. I think maybe he'll be joining us soon. Um, in the meantime, let me just explain the format a little bit. Um, I myself am going to be giving one of the presentations, but I'm also the moderator. So uh, I will try not to indulge myself and let myself go on too long and rather give the floor uh, as much as possible to these two distinguished people. So uh, let's begin uh, with Miriam for an initial discussion. Hopefully Norman will be able to join us in a few minutes and then we'll hear from him. And then I'll speak, um, each of us maybe between 10 and 15 minutes, uh, after which the three of us will interact for a while and then we will turn it over for a general discussion with you all in the audience. And please, again, as Chris said, address your questions through the Q&A function. So, Miriam Pemberton. Thank you, thank you, Bob, and thanks to the Ellsberg Initiative. It's really wonderful to be with you all and to um, be particularly with, with um, Bob, who I have known for, for many decades and, you know, admire his work more than, more than most people on the planet. <clears throat> so um, I thought I would just start by uh, sort of ticking off uh, a few of the connections between climate change and militarism, and then say a few words about um, how military jobs versus climate jobs kind of stack up with each other. <clears throat> then um, talk a, a little bit about uh, unionization rates uh, between climate workers and military workers. And then uh, I wanted to be sure <clears throat> to kind of spread a little good news that that I feel that we now have uh, this month um, uh, about the transition from military to climate jobs and how how we might go about it. <clears throat> so starting with the connections between climate change and militarism. Um, so I know Bob is going to talk about this existential threat, uh, <clears throat> but um, I wanted to mention a couple of UN reports. Um, and as we know, the UN has been looking at um uh, cl uh violent conflicts uh, you know created by climate change and um <clears throat> the way that they are you know spreading and in particular regions are um you know causing uh you know massive uh disruptions and so I, I was looking at one report about the Sahel that is right right below the Sahara um and as you know um <clears throat> you know, years of uh, conflict over scarce resources of water and food and uh, land um, caused by climate change um, has created great upheaval and, and wars and <clears throat> violent conflict in that region in particular. And the US and the UK have poured an immense amount of counterterrorism military aid into that into that region, and it simply hasn't hasn't worked. So as climate change um, begins spreading those those kinds of uh, effects across the the globe, 
conflicts over scarce resources of land and water and um, and food, <clears throat> no military on the earth is going to be able to uh, hold them back. So that's one thing. I thought I might just mention um, the skewing of foreign policy uh, toward protecting fossil fuel protection. So uh, that really goes back to uh, the Carter Doctrine. Happy birthday, President Carter. But um, the Carter Doctrine essentially said that the U.S. reserves the right to use military force all around the world to protect our, our access to fossil fuels. Um, so, and, and that, and that focus and that doctrine has, has endured really since then. Uh, so when, uh, the U S went into Baghdad during the Iraq invasion, um, <clears throat> they went, they, they, the first place they went, uh, was a beeline to, uh, the oil ministry, uh, in, in Baghdad as the rest of the ministries of the government were being looted it was the it was the protection of that oil ministry that was the primary focus initially of of us uh, forces then we have the us's the us military's own contribution in terms of generating greenhouse gas emissions um it is the largest institutional emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet um but you know some people kind of take that fact and then go to the idea that, uh, well, it's really focusing on greening the military that we really have to do because it's this largest institutional emitter. And and that would be wrongheaded. I mean, they need to be greening, they're doing some things, um, but the U.S. contribution to, to um, sorry, the U.S. military's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions uh, is about 1% of the total greenhouse gas emissions of uh, the uh, U.S. economy. So um, <clears throat> making that the primary focus is is not the answer. And that brings me to the imbalance of federal resources devoted to militarism as opposed to climate change. So um, <clears throat> there used to be a federal, a comprehensive federal uh, budget for climate change. Um, but then uh, about 10 years ago, uh, Republican members of Congress started uh, assigning staffers. Your job is to go and look at that budget and find anything that has anything to do with climate change or might and get rid of it. So um, <clears throat> sort of the, the government took the target off its back and uh, stopped doing that report. So we don't, as far as I know, have a comprehensive accounting of what we spend on climate change. But the Biden administration last year or two years ago um, created, you know, the best green uh, industrial policy and the best, uh, the largest investment we've ever had in climate change mitigation uh, with, um, you know, several of its of its initiatives, but, you know, the, the centerpiece being the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so, you know, that's that's the lion's share of what the U.S. is um, spending to incentivize its green economy. Um, <clears throat> but the amount that uh, is being put into the economy over the next 10 years to uh, to build the green economy is about four uh, percent of what what the Pentagon gets. Um, and so in terms of, you know, we have these, these security threats, we have tools, we have the military, and we have uh, investment in, you know, preventing what the military itself says, short of a nuclear exchange, uh, climate change is the greatest threat to, to US and global security. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, when we spend uh, 4% of the amount that we spend on military uh, technology on uh, dealing with this greatest threat to U.S. security, um, the imbalance is, is pretty clear. <clears throat> so I want to say a word about um, military jobs as opposed to climate jobs. Uh, Bob knows more about climate jobs than, than anyone, so I won't, <clears throat> I won't dwell on that. Um, but I will say a word about uh, the military side of things. So uh, the prime contractors 
uh, for um, <clears throat> for the military um, advertise their um, use to to all of us uh, in terms of job creation um, almost more than they do uh, with uh, you know advertising the the military tools that um, they provide for you know to to protect us. <clears throat> um, but uh, there's really less there than meets the eye. So um, back in the post-Cold War period, we had a uh, military budget come down by a third and the procurement budget funding private contracting coming down by two thirds. So um, in order to turn that situation around as, as they did, uh, military and you know jack up the military budget again, military contractors, um, started spreading their contracts. Well, they'd already been doing it, but they really, you know, they doubled down on this strategy of spreading contracts in as many congressional districts as they possibly could. So um, the F-35 fighter jet, which is uh, the, the most expensive weapon system, it doesn't, it, you know, it has been in, in development for about two decades and it's still they're they're look they're finding new defects and paying the contractors to um, <clears throat> to fix those uh, fix those defects uh, you know for for decades now. Um, uh, Lockheed Martin is the prime contractor, and uh, it advertises on its website that the F thirty uh, five is fighter jet is made in somewhere between 45 and 48 states. Now, this is obviously not a recipe for industrial efficiency, but it is certainly a recipe for political protection, which is, which is what they've done. <clears throat> uh, however, if you, if you look closely uh, in some of those states, um, uh, you know, there are 10 jobs here and, and, and 20 jobs there. Um, uh, it is really, uh, less than than meets the eye. But if you look at what the um, main industrial uh, association representing those contractors um, says about uh, the numbers of military jobs, a couple of decades ago, they were talking about 3 million jobs in, uh, in private military contracting. Now, <clears throat> They, they, um, the, the figure they use is slightly more than 1 million jobs. Um, so uh, why has why has that number come down? I mean, it's surging a bit because we are, of course, surging our military spending at the moment. But but um, <clears throat> but as a general matter, the trajectory is is downward. That has to do with outsourcing and automation mainly. But I would submit that it doesn't make a lot of sense to hold uh, hostage half of our discretionary budget, that is the budget that Congress votes for every year, <clears throat> um, hold that hostage for 1 million jobs in an economy in which almost 200 million jobs uh, are, uh, you know, exist in the, in the, in the private economy. Um, so I, Bob will um, no doubt talk more about uh, the climate job side of things, but I'll just say that the Department of Energy um, you know, estimates that there are already about 8 million jobs in the in the clean energy uh, economy, as opposed to this 1 million jobs in in uh, in the military economy. Um, just a word on uh, military versus climate uh, unionization rates. Um, <clears throat> this was obviously a big issue when uh, the Inflation Reduction Act was being negotiated. Um, uh, I think it was kind of a miracle that it actually got got uh, passed, but um, <clears throat> uh, they failed to to um, get in into the bill uh, the pri a priority given to union jobs in in the IRA. Um, they did get uh, the idea that prior priority should be given to um, <clears throat> companies that are. Uh, get that are paying the prevailing wage and that are using um, that are using apprenticeships, um, but uh, they didn't they didn't get this uh, uh, the uh, unionization 
um, uh, included in in the IRA originally. However, <clears throat> there's been a lot of organizing going on. Uh, it's it's still a very big issue, and uh, the unionization rates are climbing um, in this industry as they are falling in military industry. Um, so uh, defend, the Energy Department says that in 2024, for the first time, unionization rates in the clean energy economy exceed uh, the average in the energy sector um, as a whole. So that's about 12 <clears throat> percent. And in military industry, um, unionization rates are, in fact, falling. So there is this narrative that uh, military manufacturing uh, creates good union, high paying jobs. <clears throat> but in fact, uh, the prime contractors, many of them, um, have been working actively in recent years to de-unionize. So um, they take their work to right to work states, often in the South. Um, they also do more <clears throat> subcontracting because it's harder to organize the subcontractors. So, um, so Lockheed Martin, the defense giant behemoth of them all, um, is only at this point uh, 19% uh, unionized. And Northrop Grebman, another one of the prime contractors uh, make that makes you know missiles and these bombers, um, uh, is only four percent uh, unionized. So so this narrative is in fact a myth. Uh, last thing I wanted to do um, before I turn it over to Bob and I hope Norman um, is to spread a little good news about this transition from military to climate jobs. <clears throat> and that starts with my hero. Uh, his name is John Harrity, and he um, is the former head of the Machinist Union in the state of Connecticut, a very defense dependent state. Um, in 2012, he read uh, an article in Rolling Stone by Bill McKibben, who's I guess gonna be speaking in this series um, <clears throat> sometime soon. Uh, you know, the great climate activist. Um, and uh, reading that article, uh, John got religion on climate change. And he kind of set his sights. He never said this to me directly, but I think it's true. He set his sights on changing the posture of his union, one of the most defense dependent unions in the country, um, to turning it around um, to be a leader on, on the struggle for, um, uh, for clean energy and for making sure that the machinists, uh, you know, uh, turned this challenge into an opportunity for themselves to, um, to work in this industry. And <clears throat> so in, um, 2016, he put, uh, forward at the National Convention of the of the Machinists, um, a resolution that said, you know, climate change is real and we need to, um, you know, turn this uh, from a, a challenge for the machinists into an opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the leadership of the machinists uh, was completely opposed to this resolution. And uh, they all spoke at the convention uh, against it to turn it down. Uh, John was the only one who spoke in favor of it, um, but he talked about his grandson and the world that he wanted his grandson to um, to uh, to live in, um, and what he feared about that. And uh, the uh, assembled delegates but their union leadership and voted in favor of this of this resolution. Now, as sometimes happens, uh, the union, sorry, the, the leadership kind of sat on this and didn't do a whole lot about it. So um, he just began working, you know, I kind of hate the word tirelessly because I'm really tired of it, but in his case, it absolutely applies. So he just put himself on every board and commission having to do with climate change in the state of Connecticut. Um, he, he got on the board of the Green Bank of Connecticut, which is one of the uh, strongest and first of the, of the state green banks. Um, 
he uh, formed something called the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs, uh, which brought together all the stakeholders, all the various unions and uh, civil society, um, academics, um, just to, to sort of hash out, you know, where where's our common ground and what can we work on and so on. So um, in uh, 2020, uh, by this, you know, in four years, he really did turn things around and the leadership supported his resolution. This was sort of about a survey of the workers to um, uh, to sort of find out what they thought about climate change and their ideas for uh, how to tackle it and how much interest um, there was in, um, in uh, you know, getting climate jobs. Um, so I'll just uh, say that this year, a month ago, um, the, uh, the union uh, put together the, the strongest resolution uh, they've had on climate change. They, um, uh, and, and uh, it was, you know, adopted. And uh, the, the thing I really wanted to get to was that um, uh, John, at, with the machinists and the machinist union in general, teamed up with the Cornell uh, Climate Institute, and they came out with this study, which I think is really important. Uh, right. Could you wrap up, Miriam, please? I will. I will. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the study is called Reclaiming Our Future, a Climate Jobs Agenda for the uh, International Machinists. And uh, the agenda has just all sorts of ideas for growing the IAM membership in clean energy industries, um, ensuring climate jobs or high quality union careers, and strengthening the, the IAM at the bargain ta bargaining table and on the shop floor. So I just feel like uh, this report, again, reclaiming our future, a climate jobs agenda for the IAM um, is uh, a wealth of ideas for our movement. Thanks. Thank you so much. That's great. So I've been told that Norm is here. Are there he you, is. <laughs> where are you, Norm? Um, there he is. Okay, just in time. Perfect. So it's really my great pleasure to introduce Norman Rogers. And it is really an appropriate follow up because of what Miriam was just talking about in terms of uh, John Harrity's contributions as a leader of the Machinist Union. And she characterized John as one of her heroes. And I think it's fair to say that Norm Rogers is one of my heroes. Uh, as you already heard at the introduction, Norm himself has been working uh, in the oil refinery uh, for 25 years and has also been a, uh, is a union leader uh, among the oil refinery workers. And uh, in doing all of that, has been a leader in advancing a green transition that ha it incorporates uh, just transition for uh, workers in the in the industry, uh, and in that uh, work, Norm has also been a leader in creating the California Labor for Climate Jobs uh, organization. And I hope he'll say something about that. So, Norm Rogers, welcome. Thank you very much. Um... That's quite a lead in. Um, I would have to say that, that a lot of what I've been involved with had the opportunity to be involved with. There were folks before me that um, did a lot of the groundbreaking work. So it's basically just trying not to mess anything up that they got started. I'm going to have to ask for assistance if Brennan can run my slide deck. I apologize for being tardy. I was in a Senate hearing and um, it has been quite the scramble to get to where we are right now. Thank you, Norman, for getting back to us. I know that you were involved in an important hearing, and it's great that you made it. Yes, and that's all worked out. So um, first and foremost, my biggest concern is about workers. It's, there are workers at the refineries, but just workers in general. Um, I come from 
I'm second vice president of United Steelworkers 675, located in Carson, California. And we have close to 4,000 members, about 2,500 of which are in the fossil fuel side of things. Um, production or getting pumping it out of the ground, logistics, transporting it, and refining it. Um, we also have mattress, mattress manufacturers, folks that make light poles, cardboard boxes. We have a wide range of different industries that we represent. So this slide, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the Terracotta Army, um, an army that was built to protect, um, excuse me, to protect the first emperor of China. Um, next slide, please. They figure there's about overall 8,000 life-size clay figures, warriors, uh, horses, officers. Um, the slide or the picture on the left shows some of how they were built. And there on the right at the bottom shows what they like look like in situ. It was a really big event, took a lot of workers. And next slide, we'll point out that once those um, those horses, the all the models were built, that the workers met with the non. Oh, okay. The workers, I'm sorry, I was working on a different version. Uh, my apologies. Oh, so that um, the workers were largely put to death after uh, they finished because. The tomb was to be secret where the emperor was held. And so the folks, once they finished, they were uh, buried. They were entombed um, alive is what the current thinking is. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a resting place of a different sort. And we'll come back to this picture and give it some further explanation. Uh, next slide. This is the hawk nest, hawk's nest tunnel that was built in West Virginia starting in 1930. Um, this was a big event. The idea was to drill or dig a tunnel, I should say, that went from the New River and go downstream to power a hydroelectric plant for a Union Carbide or a hydroelectric plant to feed energy to the hydrogen or the Union Carbide plant. Excuse me. Next slide, please. It's a picture of the workers and what the tunnel looked like. Uh, next slide. So here's another description. This is what the tunnel looked look like before they filled it with water. Um, again, the project was started in 1930. One of the big issues, which actually has led to this being called the Hawk's Nest disaster, is because um, the folks that were working there weren't given proper respiratory protection. And as a result, um, they a lot of folks died. I think over 700 folks died from silicosis. Next slide. So this slide and the next one, if you would, please. It points to, uh, okay, next, next slide also. It points to how well uh, the folks are being remembered now after the fact. But as I said, um, about six, 764 workers died from silicosis. Um, it turned out it was so acute, it ended up being quite a quick and fatal disease. Some folks that died in the camp were sent by rail back home. Uh, others that were sick and hadn't died, they were sent away. The ones, others that died in the camp, because they couldn't be buried in white, cemeteries because most of the workers were african-american um they were taken over to a farm and pretty much unceremoniously buried there which would have been their final resting place except later in 1972 uh, u.s route 19 was being widened and with that those graves were dug up so that the uh, highway could be widened and by that time the bodies had de deposed decomposed so much that they were put in child size coffin, which gets us to the next slide. And there's the memorial as it stands today. So next slide, please. This will get us to a tomb of a different type. This is Detroit, Michigan. 
<clears throat> excuse me, after uh, the auto industry contracted. Those are all the same four houses in those pictures. Next slide, please. This is Youngtown, Ohio, after coal mines, coal industry contracted. And the next slide. This is the uh, Methodist Church in Gary, Indiana, after the steel mills, um, steel industry collapsed there. Next slide. So those other slides were all important because that shows another instance of how workers essentially were discarded. Um, there were some efforts to make to get to get folks training, uh, but there were, I mean, everyone's heard the stories of how um, graphic arts was the training folks got, even though there weren't any graphic arts jobs where folks worked. So this slide is Huntington Beach, California, in the early 1920s. And the reason I'm showing this one is because this is what we're faced with now. Next slide. These next few slides are all um, from California, the California oil industry. This is from 1924 in Signal Hill. This is 1933 also in, I'm sorry, same picture. Uh, next one, please. That's 1933, again, Signal Hill. Uh, next slide. This is from the 40s. Um, this scene pretty much exists today, except that the um, instead of there being oil derricks there, there's containers from the uh, from the harbor. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the Hancock oil refinery. This was a, a fire that happened in 1958. This next slide is uh, also from that same incident. This is from the ground level. This is what it looked like from the air. And next slide, this, this is gonna be from Standard Oil and El Segundo in 1967. I don't know if folks, um, what your Spanish skills are like, but El Segundo means the second in Spanish. And the city got the name the second because Standard Oil, excuse me, when they opened their first refinery in, um, Richmond, California, they decided they would go down south and open their second refinery. And that's where the name El Segundo came from. The whole city is named after a standard oil refinery. So we're gonna skip a couple of decades now and go to the next slide. This is 2012 in Richmond, California, which is where it's the Chevron refinery now, but it started out as a standard oil refinery. That upper right-hand picture is a vapor cloud release, and then the following pictures show it lighting off. This is the view from across the bay in San Francisco. Next slide is what it looked like from ground level. And the next slide, please. So this is ExxonMobil in Torrance, California in 2015. Right. The next slide is Marathon Refinery in 2020. This is actually the refinery I work at. And the next slide, this happened in uh, November of last year. This is the Marathon Martinez Refinery in Northern California. Uh, they made the switch over to renewable diesel and were starting that up when this fire took place. And the next slide. It ended with this gentleman, um, Jerome Serrano, who was um, seriously burned in that. This, slot, this picture uh, and this story comes from uh, a no November, November 29th article, about 10 days after he was originally injured. And um, third degree burns over 80% of his body. He wasn't expected to survive and so, so happy to say that he's out, he's back down in Texas now, and truly the recovery he's made is a miracle. Next slide, please. So a um, couple of things that come to mind out of all that, what we've seen happen with Detroit and the auto industry, what we've seen happen with Youngstown, Ohio and coal, what we've seen happen in Gary and steel mills in the steel industry. We watched all those folks suffer, communities suffer, 
uh, municipalities be impacted from the loss of revenue, um, which brings me to talk about the Servicemen Readjustment Act, which was also known as the GI Bill, which did untold good for GIs coming back from World War II and later military conflicts as well. The next piece there is uh, an address that was given at Harvard University on June 5th of 1947 by General George C. Marshall. And he rolled out the Marshall Plan, which was designed to help lift Europe back up and get it on its feet after all the damage that had taken place during World War II. Next slide. So that's what we're asking. We've seen that it's been done, that um, we can help folks with the GI Bill. Theoretically, we could do what we did for Europe for our folks here um, that are facing job losses because refining jobs, the refining industry is going to downsize. Um, it's being labeled as fossil fuels that we're trying to get off of fossil fuels, but we have to really be more inclusive when we do our thinking about fossil fuels because is someone that makes a muffler a fossil fuel worker? Is somebody that makes spark plugs a fossil fuel worker? So it's not just a just transition we're looking for, but it's uh, an, an accurate transition in that everyone that's being captured, every all the impacts are calculated or addressed other than just folks working in a refinery. And to get us along that path, there's been a report done already, which I'm sure you've read by now, the title, The Fair and Sustainable Economic Recovery Program for California by one Dr. Robert Poland. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Great. Thank you very much, Norm. Uh, that's an incredibly powerful material. And, uh, you know, I'll just uh, kind of clean up around the edges a little bit because we've just had two fantastic presentations. Um, and then we will um, turn it over to a general discussion. So um, first I'll just say, you know, maybe to state the obvious, but sometimes it's worth it to state the obvious. Uh, Miriam noted that we are facing an existential crisis with climate change. I think everybody knows that. Uh, but just to frame it a little bit, um, Fundamentally, the most single most important cause of, of the climate crisis is burning oil, coal, and natural gas to produce energy. Um, and that therefore, the solution, the most important thing that needs to be done to move on to a stabilization path is to uh, phase out uh, burning fossil fuels to produce energy. Now, if you look at the uh, studies by this organization called the International Energy Agency, IEA, uh, they they uh, work out different scenarios for climate stabilization. Um, and the, the world at present, burning fossil fuels to produce energy generates about, right now, about 36 million tons of, um, of, of carbon dioxide, the, the major cause of, of the climate crisis. And they go through these different scenarios, and I won't go through all of them, but just to say, they have something that they call um, current policy scenario and current commitment scenario and a net zero scenario, getting to zero emissions by 2050. If you follow their current commitments scenario for the whole world, okay, if you follow that, um, that by 2050, we are at 36 billion tons. Now, we will be at 33 billion tons if we follow the current commitments on the books now. In other words, uh, even given, and that there has been important improvements, especially in Europe and, and the, in, uh, in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, we aren't anywhere close to uh, moving onto a climate stabilization path. And, and that's really, in my view, uh, the gist of uh, the, the climate crisis and that we have to move much more aggressively than we are toward a zero emissions global economy. Um, now, um, on the question of the military spending and um, 
and climate and jobs. I'll just mention, uh, the, the first person that asked me to compare the uh, job creation through military spending versus job creation through a green transition is somebody by the name of Miriam Pemberton. Um, <laughs> So that was, uh, you know, the first time I, I built a model uh, to compare these things. Um, and it, it really coincided uh, with some things that I had read anyway, uh, including by some economists named Barry Bluestone and Bennett Harrison, who uh, were really uh, great pioneers in thinking about these things. And they said, you know, we know it, Miriam referenced this point that Congress makes uh, a, a point of, of spreading out the military budget so that all communities get to think that, OK, whatever I may think about military spending, it's good for jobs. There's jobs. There's jobs in my community. And so Bluestone and Harrison long ago, I think I read this paper in 1995, said, well, why couldn't we uh, create the equivalent job creation through something like what we now call a green transition? I mean, why do we have to think of job creation as being uh, associated with military spending per se and not spending on a green transition? So the, the, the question that I asked in this original work was, okay, look, let's look at the job creation through investing in a green economy, in particular investing in renewable energy and in energy efficiency versus spending on the military. And the answer is you get about 50% um, more jobs per dollar of expenditure through the green investments. Specifically, uh, you get about 11 jobs per million dollars of expenditure on the military including the whole supply chain. Um, and you get about 17 jobs by spending on a uh, green economy. So just on the basis of the, this issue of jobs, we've got a lot of opportunity for expanding jobs, opportunities um, through uh, investing in the green economy. I'd also note, what is this same ratio with respect to oil and gas? Well, with oil and gas, the average is about five jobs per million dollar of expenditure. That means the green economy roughly is creating, is capable of creating about three times more jobs for a given amount of spending than the, uh, than the fossil fuel sector and 50% more jobs than the military. So, Building the green economy is, in principle, good for jobs. Now, we have to make sure it's good for jobs, and that's what Norm was talking about, and also Miriam was talking about with respect to opportunities uh, created, uh, fighting for with the machinists. But the opportunity is there. There is no reason to, for anyone to ever think that the transition to a green economy is going to be uh, harmful to job creation. Now, what about the military budget, um, as Miriam was talking about? So right now, the U.S. military budget for the last year, 2023, was $1 trillion, roughly speaking, 3.6% of GDP. That's a lot of money. <laughs> it, it is less proportional to when, when in 2010, as a share of GDP, it has come down, and that is a mildly favorable development uh, along the lines that Miriam was talking about, but it's still gigantic. It's 13% of the entire federal budget, two and a half times more than spending on education. Now, what about on a global basis? A uh, global basis, total military spending is about 2.4 trillion. And that means the U.S. is spending 42% of all world global military spending. The next closest is China, so it's less than one third of the US. US military spending amounts to more than the other nine countries that are in the top 10 spending. So there is a lot of room to think about transitioning 
this uh, massive amount of military spending into spending on the green economy. And as Miriam pointed out, um, people within the military, and you should read Miriam's excellent book, um, uh, Six Steps to the National Secu on this National Security Tour. I mean, she quotes Biden, pres now President Biden, when, when Biden was vice president, he said he went and at, uh, met with military leaders in the Pentagon and asked them, what's the biggest threat to U.S. security? They said climate change. Uh, so uh, transitioning fund from the military budget to green investment is fully consistent with advancing security and uh, and also it is fully consistent with expanding, not reducing job opportunities. Um, one exercise I did in this little book uh, with Noam Chomsky and elsewhere is to say, well, let's take a modest amount of global military spending and move it into green investments. And I said, well, what about 6% of total glo global military spending? And we move it into green investments. That would be $150 billion. And that is 50% more than what all uh, high-income countries have committed per year to low-income countries to support their green transition. So that is a big pot of money sitting there to be uh, utilized to advance a green transition. And I'll also say that job creation for green transition in developing countries is also a huge opportunity. I'll just end with one point on the tr transition and, and thank you very much, Norm, for mentioning our study in California. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention a, a related study I did around the same time in Pennsylvania. And the reason I wanna mention that one is because the issue has become the uh, apparently the only uh, consideration on climate in the entire uh, current U.S. presidential uh, campaign. And that is the issue of fracking, uh, fracking in particular in Pennsylvania, and that uh, Kamala Harris four years ago said she wanted to um, uh, abolish fracking, and now that she doesn't. And so let me just say a little bit about that and how it relates to the green transition, especially in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, now, we all know that environmentally, aside from the climate impacts of burning the natural gas that is extracted from fracking, uh, fracking has massive negative environmental impacts, in particular with respect to water uh, contamination and air pollution. And that's why two states, New York and Maryland, have, uh, in fact, uh, banned fracking which is what ha uh, Harris was saying she was for four years ago for the entire country. Um, now, uh, let's talk about the job issue with respect to Pennsylvania. So uh, the entire fracking sector in Pennsylvania, uh, in a generous estimate, in, uh, it, it, uh, amounts to about 18,000 jobs. Um, that's all uh, oil and gas jobs in Pennsylvania. So it's it's a big, it's it's an over generous estimate. Uh, by contrast, if we talk about investing in a green economy in Pennsylvania, just like as Norm was saying, we talked about it for, for um, California. Our, our study estimates that you generate about 150,000 jobs, okay? 150,000 jobs versus 18,000 in fracking and oil and gas, other oil and gas activity. Now, that 18,000 jobs is still a lot of jobs, but we have to remember as part of this transition, we're not getting rid of all the jobs tomorrow. We're gonna phase out the jobs. And as we phase out the fracking jobs, um, if we look at it demographically, people are also gonna retire. So in our study, what we found is that if we really think about who is, are gonna lose their jobs in Pennsylvania, if we get rid of fracking in Pennsylvania, it ends up being about 600 jobs per year. That is after we take account of voluntary retirements and we phase it out over time, we're looking at a 600 job 
displacements per year, um, as opposed to the 150,000 jobs that we can create through investing in the green economy. So building the green economy in Pennsylvania, in California, throughout the country is good for job creation. Now, the last thing I'll mention, though, which gets to what Norm was talking about, as well as Miriam, are these high quality jobs. Um, and by high quality, we can talk of uh, many dimensions, but let's start with wages. The fact of the matter is the jobs in the fossil fuel sector are better paying. Right now, they are better paying. Miriam told us some really interesting information about the rise of unionization, and that's critically important. People like Norm are making it happen. Um, but at present, the difference in Pennsylvania, the average wage in oil and gas is 93000 The average wage for the range of uh, green energy jobs is somewhere between seventy and 80000 depending on the activity, the job you're in. So that really frames, I think, the critical importance of, as what Miriam talked about and what Norm talked about, uh, building a unionization, strengthening worker power, creating conditions under which, as we expand the green economy and creating opportunities to make sure these are good jobs. It won't happen on its own. I mean, it was never the case that oil, coal, natural gas, these weren't good jobs just on the basis of some natural uh, events. Norm shows us the way workers were treated over time in this sector. It was because people organized. It was because people fought to make these good jobs. And that's where they were. And that the green transition has to ensure that the workers that are going to move into the green economy are going to have the same conditions uh, good wages, protect their pensions, and uh, job guarantees. That can all be done. So I will end there. And um, why don't we just uh, take a few minutes to, I, I'd like to ask Miriam and Norm one basic question, and then we will turn it over to the uh, questions from people online. And the basic question I want to ask, which is the one that Chris Appy uh, suggested, which I thought was really an interesting one, is could you tell us a little bit about your personal uh, engagement, how you got involved in working around these issues, and where you think your own work has uh, gone, has the trajectory of your work, and, and where you see it going into the future. So we'll start with Marion. Okay. Um... Uh, I have kind of an odd story. I um, got a PhD in English literature, and I knew uh, by the end of the process, took me a long time because I was having babies and everything. Um, but uh, by the end of it, I knew I just didn't want to be an English professor, and I didn't know what I did want to do. Um, but I figured, you know, this is my destiny. It's been so long. So I half-heartedly began a job search. But those take a long time. And so um, I just stumbled upon a publication called Idealist.com, and there was a listing for a part-time editor for something it was a nonprofit, grandiosely titled the National Commission for Economic Conversion and Disarmament. And I didn't know what economic conversion was, but uh, the description sounded, you know, it's a progressive organization. So for six months, why don't I do that? So that's what I did. As it happened, I took the job a month before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And economic conversion turned out to be converting swords into plowshares or you know, military resources to civilian use. And so suddenly this became a big deal. And uh, it was you know, going to be the linchpin for everything I cared about. It was going to, uh, we were going to bring down the military budget and fund education and healthcare and the environment and everything I cared about. Um, and so, you know, it's a fascinating, very multifaceted field, and I just got completely hooked by it, and there went my academic career. Um, so I could go on from there, but maybe it's Norm's turn. Okay, Norm. Thank you very much. So um, my big push is uh, was very heavily into refinery health and safety and 
ended up doing um, extracurricular work outside of the refinery. Um, we had a big push to get refinery safety rules updated, and we were able to do that. And um, I guess I so none of this has been planned. There was no great design by it all. A lot of it, it was not paying attention and not saying no when I should have. <laughs> so um, that's, I, I would really love to tell a more detailed and purposeful story. But um, uh, there was work that came up and being kind of on the, not kind of, being old on the older side and not wanting to do a lot of overtime inside the refinery, um, I was asked to cover a couple of meetings because uh, my schedule was free. And like I say, it's very inglorious. And now it's been, I guess, three years, three and a half years, and I'm in the space. Um, I think a lot of what keeps me going is just kind of having a bad attitude and not performing well around authority. So <laughs> there's plenty, plenty to rail on. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Norm. Um, what about you, wanna... Bob? You, what about you, Bob? Your, your personal story. Okay, well, I'll give a very short one. I also want to, uh, first I want to read from a, a great uh, op-ed article that Norm wrote in the LA Times back in 2021. It's talking about the just transition because I really think it encapsulates a lot. So if you'll indulge me just a second. Uh, many speak of a just transition, but we've never seen one. No worker or community member will ever believe that an equitable transition is possible until we see detailed, fully funded state safety net and job creation programs. To offer these safety nets, California needs to establish an equitable transition fund for fossil fuel workers covering wage replacement, income and pension guarantees, health care benefits, relocation and peer counseling for professional and personal support. It should provide access to education and training for existing future jobs that are safe and healthy. California also needs to account for the funding gaps communities face when their tax bases shrink so schools and libraries can stay open. Longer term, transitioning the workforce should mean creating stable jobs with good pay and benefit. Uh, I think Norm, you know, really provides us with a really brilliant summary of a lot of stuff that I can write in 200 pages, but Norm did in one. <laughs> uh, and I'll just say beyond that, how I got on this issue was exactly what, as, as I was saying, because I, um, you know, I, I do macroeconomics and jobs is a big part of what we do in macroeconomics. And I do it from a progressive standpoint. Um, and uh, a lot of what I, you know, was hearing just general chatter was, okay, if you're interested in, you know, uh, climate issues, that's great. That's really nice. That's good. But it's it's a disaster in terms of people's living standards and jobs. That's, and indeed, the, uh, I remember a New York Times, a New York Times poll said, okay, we can think about climate stabilization. They didn't use that term or we can think about, you know, the environment and climate, or we can think about jobs and income. And here's the poll. Choose your priority. Which one? Now, naturally, about 70% said jobs and income. And climate's fine, but it's not as important to my life. Now, um, you know, I saw that and, and similar ones like that. They ran several of those. And and then you know I it didn't I didn't really crystallize in my thinking on it until I read this article by Bluestone and Harrison and I wish I could remember the name of it and they just pointed out well investing in building a green economy is investing investing means job creation and so the question is uh, how many jobs so that's really when I got started on this and more or less around that time when I got started then I got this contact from this person named Miriam Pemberton and asked me to actually do a study, which I was already thinking I wanted to do. So it was uh, a, a really good convergence. And so that's, I've been at it ever since. So I think we have time. Let's uh, give, turn it over, uh, Chris. Uh, 
Uh, you have questions? Yeah, um, only a few questions have come in, so I encourage people that are listening to uh, add your questions to the Q&A. Uh, I would say you all did a fabulous job debunking this widespread and powerfully supported but uh, uh, claim that our well-being depends on uh, sustaining these uh, insane amount of you know, military spending and uh, commitment to fossil fuels. Um, one person, Henry uh, Lowendorf, is curious to know, um, what can we do with Congress to try to uh, really push bills that lead toward a just transition to, to Greenpeace? And uh, who, what are the names of a few people in Congress we, we might rally around? Miriam, I think you're the one most direct. Oh, not really, but... Um... Uh, Norm, do you do you work with Ro Khanna at all? I mean, he's been a he's been a good leader on, you know, military uh, uh, economy and green economy, and um, uh, he just he seems like a very smart guy. Do you do you have anything? Uh, do you do you ever work with him on anything? So no, um, the efforts here have been. For California, within California, so dealing with legislation. He's, he's a he's a yeah he's a congressman in California. So right, but I mean, like dealing with the state. Um, yeah. Mm. So mm. we who have we had also like Lena Gonzalez, uh, Maria Elena Durazo, folks like that have helped us push bills. Isaac Bryan, um, he's also helped us helped us push bills. We were fortunate. In 2022, uh, we won money in the budget for a displaced oil and gas worker fund. Originally, it was $40 million. It got knocked down to 30 because there was um, we were having budget issues in the state. And from that $30 million, um, three, I think there were three grantees. Um, so um, there was positive support from the legislature on that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answered your question or not. And I just, I just add that, um, what happens in the next month is, is going to change everything. And, and, uh, we don't know what we're going to be dealing with, but, um, you know, uh, I, well, can I say something partisan? Maybe not, but, sure. but, um, Clearly, the Congress. Uh, well, it, it it depends. Uh, you know who has the House for for one thing. Um, uh, you know, in this uh, Republican um, controlled House, uh, nothing is going to get done uh, on on these issues. Um, so you know, we just have to sort of see what happens and regroup and, um, you know, kind of figure out uh, what's possible, you know, after November, I think. So I'll just, just say, uh, um, go ahead, Bob. Uh, yeah, so, just okay. quick. so I, I'll, I'll just say, um, well, first of all, I'd love to hear more from you, Norm, about exactly where everything, you know, conditions are in California with respect to these uh, green transition policies generally, because you know, if we can take California, you know, if it if it were a country, it'd be the I think the sixth biggest economy in the world, and it's also one of the most open to thinking about uh, green transition policies. So there's lessons to be learned from California. So yeah, and I you know the the study that Norm mentioned was nice enough to mention that we did for California. It wasn't it was endorsed by 22 unions. Um, and uh, so you you do have some momentum as a result of the organizing done by unions. But I want I'll mention my experience talking about much much less hospitable environment in which we did one of our studies, and that was the state of West Virginia. So uh, we did the West Virginia study around the same time as Pennsylvania and and California, and um, when our study came out and goes through these issues around transition. Uh, I was really surprised that uh, number one, um, well, I wasn't surprised that the AFL-CIO in general 
uh, was supportive, but the mine workers union in in, um, in in West Virginia was you know willing to was open to thinking about it as long as following what Norm said, we had a, a robust transition program for workers that really respects where they are, where you know what they fought for, what they've achieved, um, and how to move them into other areas in the communities. Um, and then we did, we were invited to give a presentation to um, um, Senator Manchin's office, you know, the, 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 the evil senator who's himself tied to the coal industry and was holding up uh, whatever work that with the Biden administration was trying to do that did eventually pass as the Inflation Reduction Act because they got the vote from Manchin. And I'm not saying it was our study that swayed Manchin. But in talking in, in particular to his staff and the union people uh, talking to Manchin, it, it was clear, um, you know, whether they were taking our study seriously or not, it was clear that the, the, the notion that uh, investing in a green economy was going to be good for jobs, good for employment opportunities, if it was done in the right way. Um, it did it, it did sink in uh, with at least the mansion staff. And um, so if, if you can even sway the mansions of the world a little bit by this kind of approach, I think, you know, we have, a, you know, it's it's easy to think about like the congressman we have here, Jim McGovern, of course, he's going to be for it. Uh, most of the ones in Massachusetts, no problem. You know, our, our, our senator, uh, our, you know, endorsed the Green New Deal uh, and so forth. But, you know, let's think about the hard ones, or at least the ones that are on the fence, and think about ways to persuade them. And I do think that making the point that what people like Norm um, and the machinists that Miriam was talking about are arguing for is probably the single strongest lever to move, let's say, centrist or right-leaning Democrats on these issues. And those are the people I think we really need to bring along. Yeah, Marion. Um, so just uh, speaking of West Virginia, I'm not remembering the details, but um, looking at all the uh, Inflation Reduction Act grants that have been given so far and tax credit plans. I know there is one in West Virginia, which was exemplary in the way that it actually uh, prioritized uh, hiring fossil fuel workers or, you know, coal, whatever is there, um, and putting them into a training program and getting them uh, directly into, you know, a job in something to do with the with green energy, so that it, there wasn't this sort of, you know, in the post Cold War period, there was kind of um, uh, we need retraining funds, but but never this direct com uh, connection, taking people from one kind of job and seamlessly uh, training them up to do this other kind of job. And so there are examples, and one of them was in West Virginia. I just don't remember much more about. It. I think it's actually a Toyota plant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, elect I think it's components for electric batteries. Mm. You know. Anyway, mm. yeah, Norm, can you tell us something about where, where things are in California on this stuff? Well, um, so more broadly, so last week, last week, I get, maybe it was the week before last, whenever climate week was in New York, um, I went. And um, there were numerous sessions all across Manhattan, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, everywhere. And so I would ask folks how often um, had they seen the term phase out used when they were looking through the schedule about classes they wanted to attend. And we said, oh, I can't even count how many times. And so then my next question would be, how often did you see the term phase in? And you know, they had to hit control alt delete because their brains locked up because they <laughs> never saw phase. And that's the problem. So we have policies in place 
where we've inserted ourselves between someone and their paycheck. And if we're going to do that, then um, we need to have at least the next three steps lined out so we can explain to folks it's safe to take this next step. And that's not where we are. And so even within California, with the successes we've had, um, we still don't have that because the end of all of this is going to be a job. Somebody that's employed now isn't going to be and wants to be. We don't have that pool of jobs. And so that makes it difficult. So early retirement, getting folks out of that pool of folks that need help. Um, if somebody's close to um, retirement, hopefully we could find something to tide them over. Somebody does find work. Um, and it's not paying quite as well as far as wages and benefits go, that there's some kind of gap closure there. There's some funds to close that gap. Um, this is all to get back to the displaced oil and gas worker fund because those things weren't a part of that plan. Um, we asked for it. Um, in 2020 in Martinez, California, the Marathon Refinery there switched to renewable diesel and they let go about 350 people. And <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Virginia Parks did a study of those folks um, to find out what their experiences have been like. And they were asked, what did they see as a fix? What would have helped them in their situation? And they said, a cash disbursement. So at the very beginning, when they found out they were losing their jobs, um, some cash on hand to kind of help settle the dust so they could see what was coming next. That's not part of the displaced oil and gas worker. We have to be happy and thankful because we got it and we haven't had it before. Um, and we're going to do what we can with it because it is a pilot program. So we have to show we can be successful with it. But we know what's needed um, from the slides I show, showed earlier. We know what it, bad looks like. And um, yeah, in the end, it's jobs. Maybe it's universal health care because then you don't have to pay put somebody quite so much on their wages if their health care is taken care of. Um, I'll stop there because I'm, I'm rambling. Are, are there more questions, Chris? Yeah, someone asks, what role uh, do universities play in leading the way to just transition? As everyone knows, there's been a big upsurge of camp campus activism uh, in the last year or two. And a big part of that has been the call for divestment uh, from uh, military spending. So what, what, uh, what hope can we place in the university to move us in this direction? Well, being a university guy, <laughs> uh, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, one may, may be slightly controversial, which is uh, I'm all for divestment movements in principle, but I think we have to realize uh, other than, you know, kind of galvanizing people, I don't think they accomplish very much. Um, think about it. Divestment means exactly this. It means that some entity, a university or let's say they own a stock in um, Raytheon um, and the university says, okay, we're going to sell the stock as a matter of principle. And I, I applaud the principle. But it also means that somebody else is going to buy the stock. Uh, and, you know, we can think about, you know, private equity, hedge funds, whoever. They're going to buy the stock. And I did a study with one of my former PhD students, and we asked the question, to what extent has divestment movements really damaged the uh, st status of, of companies, let's say, on Wall Street? fossil fuel companies in, in the study that we did? And the answer was not at all. And so um, uh, I think it's important that we think about um, strategies that aren't, you know, again, I, I applaud people for their commitments, um, but let's think about strategies that actually will have some more leverage. And, and that therefore, it, with respect to universities, with respect to uh, climate issues, I would argue that we focus much more on getting the universities off of fossil fuels. Just say, we're off. And you know, if you think about that, and if you think about demanding that, 
Um, then we are, you know, and then that idea spreads uh, throughout communities. Then we are actually uh, moving the dial in a significant way. And I should just mention at my own university, um, which, by the way, is has uh, been a pioneer both in the anti uh, and the divestment movement, um, and creating the Sunrise uh, Movement, uh, which is now national. Uh, but the students moved beyond that and uh, demanded that we phase out fossil fuels. And uh, um, our previous chancellor ended up agreeing with the students and committing to being off of fossil fuels by 2035. Now, whether we're going to accomplish it requires more struggle. But um, anyway, that's my take on it. Uh, just a couple things. Um kind of on the good news side, uh, it seems like, you know, it, the Gaza war and uh, uh, all of the protests um, have, you know, inspired, you know, students to uh, investigate, you know, what are the, what is this university doing in terms of its contracts and, you know, what, what uh, what is my research going to be contributing in terms of um, uh, you know military re research? And there are some, I think, uh, stronger groups uh, of among graduate students, uh, you know, resisting uh, the the requirements for their research that they be involved in military research. On the other hand, uh, I read some place recently that. Um, that investment by the Pentagon in universities across the country is on the rise and that now 14 universities um, receive more than a hundred, or this, this past year have received more than a hundred million dollars in, in military contracts. So, um, so it's a struggle. That's all I can say. In this environment, it's with, with this, with um, the surges in military spending, this is, it's a struggle. So uh, maybe we have time for one more question, um, Chris? Yeah, there are uh, two sort of related questions. Someone wants to know, are there actually in DC full-time lobbyists working on climate change and a green economy? And related to that, someone wants to know, how do you counter narratives uh, in the media and by even prominent politicians who completely deny uh, climate change? What have been some of the more effective arguments or, pol or, or political steps to take to, to make a broader portion of the public, uh, you know, ex accept these basic realities? Hmm. Norm, you want to respond yeah. first? So there's a couple of pieces. One, one is a dodge, actually. Um, our, our, the makeup of our rank and file there's a lot of conservative members to that. And um, while discussions about climate would be best in order for there to just not be flat out brawls, our discussions are about um, the demand going away. And that's quite easy to see that. And it's been happening over time. Gas mileage got better on it on cars. And now there's more electric cars. And as things stand right now, our peak here in California for gasoline was 2017, and it's been on the decline ever since. So that's one piece. Um, the other piece is truly, um, I'm going to say, talking to people. Ask somebody in Florida on the West Coast today, what's, what's the last 30 years look like for you? Is the last 10 years different than the previous 20? Um, what fish have disappeared um, in fishing streams? What birds don't you see anymore? What's the size of the deer? I mean, think those are stories that can be told at a very grassroots level on what things look like, where there used to be water flowing and now there isn't. How far um, inland now do the storms come when there's a hurricane? Um, there's going to be things. How hot is it? And, and two... Was it three, 2022, maybe? There was forest fires in Colorado in November. Uh, it was either November or December. It should have been 
cold and frosty. No, it was warm and dry and there were forest fires. So um, a collection of what's actually going on, you can show graphs and charts and things, but what's actually happening on the ground shown as a collective, I think would carry some weight. Yeah, just piggybacking on that, I would just say uh, the best lobbying force is what people are feeling on their skin. You know, nobody can avoid seeing what's happening. They can be in denial about it, uh, but, but you know, it's there and it has, you know, in, in certainly in my lifetime or the last year, uh, you know, the signs are intensifying. They, you don't need to read reports. You're, it's right there on your, on your skin. Now in Washington, you know, there are a lot of, um, lobbying uh, groups, environmental groups, they do strong lobbying. Um, on the other hand, on the military side of the equation, um, Lockheed Martin, you know, this one contractor has more lobbyists than uh, members of Congress themselves. So there again, <laughs> it's a struggle. <laughs> well, I think we're uh, pretty much yeah. out of time. Uh, so I, I'll just thank uh, Miriam and Norm for uh, great presentations, participating, and all the important work you do. Keep it going. And I'll turn it over to Chris. Well, thank you all for a really great webinar. Very stimulating. Um, much appreciated. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we have another event just uh, on Thursday, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. So please uh, register for that and uh, see you then. So thanks everybody, have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, take care. Take care, yeah.